Assalamu alaikum and alhan wa sahlan everyone. You're all very welcome and thanks for coming here to NYU AD on a work night in the middle of the week to hear an academic talk about uh, the political troubles of two smallish islands very far away from here. Um, although I was curious uh, to know how many of you are Europeans. Actually, do you mind me asking, how many of you are Europeans? Do you want to stick up your hands, Europeans? Okay, so that, that maybe tells me something about why people have come here. So for you, it's not so uh, irrelevant, maybe. For people who aren't from Europe, um, why might you be interested in, in learning something about Brexit? Well, first of all, you know, we're all human beings, and human beings like a good story. And it's a fascinating story right now in London. It's much too interesting a story, actually, for comfort. And it's going to reach a climax maybe in the next six weeks or so, or maybe not, we can't even tell. But it's always helpful when listening to a story to know what the backstory is, and maybe I can help out there. Um, second reason, I suppose, is that if uh, Britain leaves Europe uh, without a deal, either on Halloween or at some later date, which is entirely possible, uh, this will probably cause a lot of economic disruption, certainly in Britain, certainly in my own country, Ireland, also in the rest of the European Union, and this at a time when the world economy isn't doing that well anyway, and people might be curious to know, well, why on earth did this bad thing happen? Um, and thirdly, I think it's fair to say that the events of 2016 uh, in Britain uh, didn't occur in a vacuum. Uh, Donald Trump was elected in the same year, and we've had populists come to power in Italy, in, uh, in Austria, uh, and then they've come out of power uh, subsequently. And in many of these cases, a common refrain is that people want to take back control. That was the Leave campaign's slogan in Britain. They wanted to take back control of British laws, British frontiers, and take back control from whom? And the answer is from multilateral organizations of one sort or another, which constrain what sovereign governments can do uh, with the view of promoting the collective interest. And I mean, if there, I mean, there are, I think, some Emiratis here. I mean, UAE is a small country. Ireland is a small country. Small countries have an interest, I think, in living in a world that is governed by multilateral decision making and the rule of law rather than the law of the jungle. Uh, you can see why Donald Trump might want to uh, rid himself of the constraints of the World Trade Organization. For smaller countries, uh, we need these institutions to survive, I think. So that's by way of motivation. I'm going to be talking largely about a book that I wrote for a French audience, actually, for, for reasons that I won't go into now, that was subsequently published in uh, Britain. It's coming out in paperback in a few days' time. And what this book was trying to do was to explain to the French, who are you know, interested enough by Brexit, but who don't necessarily know what's going on, um, to try to explain to them why Brexit happened, but also to try to explain to them why the negotiations that have happened since 2016 have been so difficult, and why they may end up breaking down, and in particular, why they may end up breaking down because of the question of uh, the Irish border. And in order to do that, you need to provide three backstories. You need to provide them with a bit of British history, of course, but you also need to tell them something about the history of the European Union because you don't understand Brexit without understanding the European Union that Britain is Brexiting from. And finally, uh, because the Northern Irish question may be the cause of a no-deal Brexit, you also need to understand something about Irish history. And so what I try to do in the book is I try to show how these three intertwining and interrelating but also separate histories have come together and are now colliding with each other and providing, producing the present impasse um, and how they're doing so within a particular historical and institutional context. And the institutional context that matters is that we have things called free trade areas and we have things called customs unions. And they're not the same thing, although people sometimes forget that. And we also have something called the European single market. And that's a different thing again. And you need to understand these distinctions. All you need to do is, it's not complicated. You just need to know what the differences are. Um, and once you know those differences and once you understand these three histories, then I think what has been happening since 2016 starts making a lot of sense. But let me begin, first of all, uh, with Britain. And let me begin with the British Conservative Party. When David Cameron was asked by Nick Clegg, the Liberal Democrat Deputy Prime Minister, 
during the coalition government that Cameron led between 2010 and 2015, why on earth Cameron was going to commit to a referendum. Cameron said to Clegg, I have to commit, I have no choice. It's a question of party management. Cameron felt that he had to call a referendum because otherwise these terrible divisions within the British Conservative Party, the Tory party that had been going on uh, for 20 or 30 years, they would never be resolved. Um, but the Tory party has a history and it's probably conventional to begin with this chap. So who is this fellow? I would ask you if you were my students. And um, I don't see any hands, but it's Sir Robert Peel. Sir Robert Peel was the Prime Minister of Britain during the 1840s, and he was a Conservative Prime Minister, a Tory. The Tories are Conservative in European terms. That means the Conservatives are always the party of the big landowners. And as Jean points out, landowners in Europe traditionally don't like free trade because that means cheap food. And the big question of the day was whether Britain should stick with free trade, uh, should stick with protection, sorry, for agriculture, uh, maintaining the incomes of landowners, or whether it should go to free trade. And in 1846, Peel surprises everybody and, 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 and introduces free trade at the cost of splitting his party, because many Tories can't stand this, and at the cost of bringing in a liberal government that then will dominate British politics for the next generation or so. So Robert Peel is a cautionary tale. You will often come across British Conservatives saying, whatever we do, we mustn't do uh, appeal. Um, free trade becomes part of British conventional wisdom in the 19th century. They rule the seas, they dominate much of the world. It's maybe not a bad policy for them to pursue at the time, but there are always some Conservatives who remain doubtful about free trade. But the Conservatives aren't the only British party that are having a bit of trouble at this stage. So this is um, the Liberal Party. This is the unmistakable figure of William Gladstone, who is the great champion of Ireland during the 19th century in the British House of Commons. And this is his opponent, Joseph Chamberlain, who's a self-made businessman. He's from Birmingham. He's a radical liberal in many ways. He's in favor of expending the franchise He's in favor of just establishing the church and various other things, but he's not radical when it comes to the empire. He's very keen on the empire, and he's also very keen on Britain's union with Ireland. And what they're fighting about here is Gladstone's proposal to give a certain limited amount of home rule, self-government to Ireland. And this causes the liberals to split. Joseph Chamberlain and his fellows march out of the party and found something called the Liberal Unionist Party. The Liberal Unionist Party will end up in coalition with the Conservatives towards the end of the century, and they eventually merge, so the Liberal Unionists and the Conservatives eventually merge to form the Conservative and Unionist Party of our own day. So today's Conservative and Unionist Party partly has its roots in ongoing fights in the 19th century about the extent to which Ireland should be independent. In 1903, uh, Chamberlain decides that he's going to do essentially what Jean Monnet would do in Europe 50 years later. He decided that he would try to promote the political union of the white Anglo-Saxon races, and he definitely was only concerned with the white peoples of the British Empire by forming a customs union. So his notion, this was a time when people were racists, and it was a time when people were imperialists, and it was a time also when England was concerned by the rise of Germany and the rise of America. And so how were they to offset this challenge and the answer was by forming a political union that would then allow Britain to continue to punch above its weight and the route to a political union was a commercial union. So it does look rather like Jean Monnet uh, and his uh, plan for Europe, although in a completely different context. Now the Tory party splits again. They can't decide what way they're going to go and poor old Balfour, who is the Tory prime minister at the time, he tries to keep the different wings of his party together and he does so by engaging in essentially verbal formulas that don't mean anything when you analyze them. But the hope was that he could stop anybody from splitting off from the party. And so he promoted what he called fiscal freedom, which means that they would negotiate trade deals, but they would disregard free trade doctrine. So there was something in it for everybody. They would have tariffs, oh yes, but they wouldn't have protection as their primary object. So that was what he tried to do. It, 
didn't really work in the long run. The Tories were split and the Liberals won a landslide at the 1906 general election and Britain remained free trading until World War I. So the Tory party has a long history of infighting about the relationship that Britain should have with the rest of the world economically. And I suppose the reason why this is such a sensitive issue is that when you talk about trade policy, you're not just talking about economics, you're talking about what sort of a country you see yourself as and how you fit into the overall world system. So the Tories have a history, but so does the EU. And the EU's history starts, I'm not going to start in the middle of the 19th century, I'm going to start with the wars. And of course, if you're European, certainly if you're a continental European, the notion that European integration has something to do with World War I and World War II, and indeed with the Franco-Prussian War, uh, which we shouldn't forget about either, that notion is, is just a commonplace. And so I thought I would put up this quotation from a memo that was given by David Cameron before the British started celebrating n November the 11th, uh, early in Cameron's reign. And you show this to many French people or Germans and their jaws drop. They can't quite believe that you would make such a claim. But there's always been a certain sort of British politician that's had a hard time with this notion that Europe is in fact a peace project and they have an even harder notion with the fact that this project may in fact have helped to keep, to keep the peace. But what British Eurosceptics have primarily been upset about is the fact that the EU is supranational. In other words, it's not just an agreement between countries not to have tariffs. Uh, they have that in North America, but what they don't have in North America is they don't have a commission, they don't have a parliament, they don't have a council, they don't have a council of ministers, they don't have a court. Uh, they don't have all of that infrastructure uh, that we have in Europe. And what they especially don't have is rules for, of decision making that might mean that you could find yourself in a minority on an issue as a country and yet you would be obliged to go along with what everybody else in the club thought. And that's what we have in Europe, and that's what a certain sort of British person, but not just British Eurosceptics, Eurosceptics elsewhere, have a hard time with. M Mrs May makes the point very nicely in that quotation from our Florence speech in September 2017. So why is the EU supranational? And I think there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, Europe, I mean, as people in this part of the world know all too well, used to punch above its weight. That wasn't positive for most of the people in most of the world. But, but Europe was influential, and it's becoming less influential as time goes on. This is a remarkably prescient quotation from Maurice Faure uh, during the uh, debates uh, in the French Assemblée about whether or not they should approve uh, the Treaty of Rome. And it's always seemed clear to Europeans that if it's to have any uh, hope of weighing at all in the world, it has to speak with uh, a common voice. And since the Second World War, Europe has obviously become less bloodthirsty and more uh, committed to uh, peaceful cooperation uh, among the countries of the world. And it particularly makes sense for Europeans to hang together when it comes to trade policy. So the EU has a common trade policy. And that way, Europe uh, does, in fact, have an influence in the world that it wouldn't have if everybody tried to negotiate with the Americas and the Chinas of this world uh, separately. But of course, if you have a common trade policy, then you have to agree on what that trade policy will be. And so you need decision-making rules to decide on what that common policy should, common policy should be. So you're into supranational decision-making. But that's not the only reason why Europe ended up being supranational. Um, the 1930s really are at the heart of what's going on here because they were so disastrous and not just because they led to World War II and the Holocaust and so on. Uh, the interwar period saw governments uh, failing their agricultural uh, populations that were very important and a lot of these people end up voting, for example, for the Nazis in Germany. There's mass unemployment, uh, people are left on the streets, there aren't proper welfare systems, uh, and there's mass social unrest and, and political radicalization. And after 1945, people are adamant that this must not happen again. And so the European response is try to create a sort of a mixed economy with welfare states that will protect people from the excesses of the market as people understood it then. Part of the story here has got to do with agriculture. There were countries in Europe that were still very agricultural in 1945, and there was no way that they were just going to allow farmers to uh, put up with whatever the market would give them. Like, like Jean said, 
uh, uh, Europe had become protectionist in the late 19th century, and it's protectionist in agriculture uh, today. So everybody had uh, agricultural policies that somehow increased farmers' incomes, uh, would keep them on the land. They hoped that didn't really work, but would at least give them a different standard of living. Everybody had that, including the British. Well, now, you have a free trade agreement of some sort within Europe. You can either choose to include agriculture or exclude it. Well, if you exclude agriculture, that's not going to make the French or the Italians very happy. So you'd better include agriculture. But if you're going to include agriculture, then you're going to have to have a common agricultural policy to replace all of the individual agricultural policies. And that also requires supranational uh, decision making. And you also need to have welfare states. And what they are terrified of is that if they have free trade across Europe, you will have competition between countries, and that competition will make it difficult for individual European countries to maintain the welfare protections that their workers have now obtained. And so let me give you some examples uh, of this. Um, in, in the Treaty of Rome, you find, which is the founding document of the EEC as it was, you find not just stuff about free trade, you find stuff about labor law. You know, we're all going to have to have decent working conditions. Uh, we're going to have social security elsewhere. We're going to worry about occupational hygiene, a very old fashioned term. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about collective uh, bargaining between employers. We're going to have equal pay for men and women. Now, do we think that this is in the Treaty of Rome because these uh, Christian democratic men, because they were nearly all men who were born before 1914 and probably in the 19th century were feminists? Probably not. They had uh, equal pay between men and women in this treaty because the French had equal pay for men and women. And the French did not want other countries in Europe to undercut their competitiveness by paying their women less. So we're doing this, so you all have to do this. Um, there, were, there were different paid holiday schemes in different countries. Again, it's saying you're all going to have the same entitlements to paid holidays, because otherwise you could unfairly uh, compete against us. The French are very worried, for example, about competition from German car makers at this time. A particular uh, concern was overtime pay. So there's a lot of text there in French, which you don't have to read. But what this is about is that the French had already moved to a 40-hour working week. The Belgians and the Germans still had a 48-hour week. Now, car workers in France actually were working 48 hours as well. But the fact that there was a 40-hour week meant that the car workers had overtime, so they got paid extra. And they didn't want to be in a situation where they were paying a lot of extra overtime, and the Germans weren't. So they said to the Germans, you must have the same rules on overtime as we do. And the Germans said, we're not sure we can do that. And what you have here is they say, it's a nice phrase, we, we esteem, we, we, we're kind of going to assume that it'll all work out. But then there's a kicker in the second clause, which is if it doesn't work out, the French retain the right to do something about it and to protect their car makers. So this was something that they couldn't agree during the negotiations. But and a man in Belfast came up to me when I showed this slide, and he kept me in a very excited uh, frame of mind. He said, you mean this is a backstop, he said. And I said, that's exactly right. It's a backstop. It's an insurance policy. This was something that they weren't able to agree during the negotiations. And so the French retained the right to protect their car industry if what they hope will happen doesn't in fact happen. That's exactly what the current backstop is as well. All right. So these 1930s lessons had big implications right from the beginning on how Europe was constructed. It's constructed in a particular international context. And to tell that story, I'm going to go back to Britain again. And I'm going to go back to Joseph's son, Neville, the man who waved the piece of paper saying, peace in our time. It's that Neville Chamberlain. He becomes the Minister for Finance in 1931. And he does, whoops, and he does what his father dearly had wanted to do. He introduces imperial preference. In other words, you're now going to have tariffs on British empire goods, taxes on imports, that are lower on, than tariffs on foreign goods. So there's going to be explicit discrimination in favor of the empire and against foreign goods. And that, not surprisingly, leads to a big increase in the share of Britain's ex imports coming from the empire. Now, I'm not picking on the Brits. Uh, by showing you these slides. I could show you similar slides for other countries, but I've, I've worked on uh, this case myself. Everybody's doing this. 
So the 1930s is a period where everybody is discriminating in favor of their empires. And if you don't have an empire, e.g. Germany, well, you probably would like to have an empire and you're soon going to have an empire. And they're doing things that are rather similarly uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the Japanese are trading more with Korea and Taiwan. And of course, they're going to do things as well later on uh, in Asia. And this is viewed as very dangerous because if you have trade that is not an economic matter but that ends up looking rather geopolitical, then people start thinking about it strategically. And when people start thinking about trade strategically, then you start worrying about how will I get my oil if there's a war? And well, we know that there are two ways to get oil or anything else that you might want. You could buy it or you could take it. And increasingly people start thinking, well, maybe I should take it. And people at the time were under no uh, doubts, but that this increased trade towards discrimination in trade was one of the main sources of tension in the run-up to World War II. And we know that both the Germans and the Japanese are very, maybe it's clearer in the Japanese case, you know, because you don't have the deranged uh, personality of Hitler to get in the way. But, but, but in the German case also, you can see that this, this search for strategic self-sufficiency was a big motivating factor behind a lot of their policies. And so um, people are clear that we can't have this anymore. So this is a picture taken off of the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, America hasn't yet gone to war. They're soon going to go to war. The uh, two Anglo-Saxon powers that are soon going to become allies issue something called the Atlantic Charter, which amounts to a statement of war aims of what's going to become the United Nations. And the fourth of these eight points is that they would ensure that after the war, everybody, no matter who you are, will get access on equal terms to the trade and raw materials that you need. So we're going to have a world after the war in which there will no longer be discrimination when it comes to trade. And this is, this is the central founding principle of international trade law since 1945. And uh, it's embodied in Article 1 of the GATT, not Article 37 or Article 52. It's Article 1, and it's Article 1 for a very good reason. So with respect to customs duties uh, and how you collect them, and with respect to all rules and regulations regarding how you deal with goods when they cross your frontiers, you basically have to treat everybody the same. That's what that's saying. You cannot discriminate between your trading partners. As soon as they're in the GATT, as soon as they're in the World Trade Organization, you have to treat them all the same. And this is important, and it will be important for Britain after Brexit as well. And not everybody there has fully grasped the implications of all of this. Now, what are the exceptions? There was an exception made for the old empires and so on, but the exceptions that um, concern us most uh, have to do with Article 24 of GATT, and in particular it says that notwithstanding the fact that you're not allowed to discriminate, you can discriminate in two specific contexts, if there's a free trade area or if there's a customs union. And it spells out what those two things are. So what's a customs union? A customs union is we have no taxes on imports from each other. So I import from Jean free of taxes and he imports from me free of taxes. But also, secondly, we have a common trade policy vis-a-vis -vis everybody else. That's a customs union. And a free trade area is just me and Jean don't have taxes on each other, but we can do whatever we like with other people. So a, a customs union is a free trade area, plus we have a common external trade policy. Now, you might ask, why on earth would anybody go for a customs union instead of a free trade area? Uh, if you can have a free trade area and it's legal, because if you have a customs union, we all have to agree on treating other countries the same way. We have to have a common trade policy. This seems like it's constraining us. Well, the reason is as follows. Imagine that uh, France and the UK do a free trade area. And imagine that French tariffs on imports of lamb from New Zealand are 10%. Well, now the French and the British have a free trade area, and so the Brits can export their lamb for free uh, to France. France needs a border vis-a-vis -vis New Zealand. It needs to have agents at the ports to check the lamb coming in and to collect taxes on them. But now imagine that the Brits go ahead and do a free trade deal with the New Zealanders, and they admit their lamb for free into Britain. I mean, does anybody see a problem? There's a rather obvious practical problem, and the practical problem is that uh, what's to stop 
somebody from importing the lamb into Britain and then exporting it uh, to France uh, for zero, saying it's British lamb and exporting it for zero percent. Well, it, for, as far as the French are concerned, it doesn't matter if it's coming direct from New Zealand or if it's coming from Britain. If it's New Zealand lamb, it has to pay a 10 percent tax. And so the French are necessarily going to have to have border controls with Britain. So whenever you have a free trade area, you have border controls. And you need to have border controls because it's only your partner that gets to benefit from zero tariffs. Everybody else has to pay tariffs, right? And you need these border controls to check that the land that's coming in is British and not from New Zealand. So that's land, that's easy. Now, nowadays we have things like cars. And then you tell, well, how, what is a car? Is it, is it a British car? Is it an American car? God knows. And so they have complicated things called rules of origin that determine whether or not this thing is a British car or a Japanese car or whatever. But so free trade areas require borders between partner countries to check for these rules of origin. What's the solution? The solution is if you have a customs union, now it doesn't matter, then you have the same trade policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, New Zealand, it doesn't matter if it exports to Britain or France, it's always going to pay the same tariff and the French no longer have to check land coming in from Britain because it's going to pay zero anyway. So that's the solution, so that's, so that's why you would have a customs union, but it comes at a cost, which is it constrains you. You can't choose to do whatever you want with whomever you want. The Europeans, after 1945, chose a customs union partly because they didn't want to have these internal barriers, and that was a very important reason, but also because they thought that having a common trade policy would give them more bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. But this was a problem for Britain, and it was a problem for Britain because it now meant that Britain had to choose. And in particular, it had to choose, was it going to privilege its trade relationships with Europe, or was it going to privilege its trade relationships with its former empire, with the Commonwealth? Uh, in order to be fully part of the European game, it would have to be part of the customs union, but that meant that it would no longer be able to have uh, preferential trade deals in place with Australia and New Zealand and so on. And that was a big deal for Britain because, I mean, we forget it now, but uh, in the 1950s, Britain still owned a pretty large chunk of the globe. I mean, they'd lost India uh, early on and so on, but the winds of change have not yet swept across Africa. They believe that the Commonwealth is important for them politically, and this is a very difficult for them, thing for them uh, to give up. And there was also the, the practical point that they had food policies that were very different from European food policies in the way that they helped farmers, and it was going to be difficult for them to adopt the common agricultural policy also. And so, as they ob observe the Continentals gradually beginning to think, well, maybe we should go for a customs union. Uh, well, you can see what the, what the chap thought, you know. Uh, it's, not, it's not a great thing, you know, but being excluded from it is not brilliant either. And, and that, that perfectly sums up, I think, a certain British attitude towards European integration. What they eventually do is they come up with a brilliant scheme that will allow them to satisfy all of their primary requirements. They propose to the Europeans, who are at this stage well on their way to creating a European economic community, that they would do a free trade deal with the Europeans. Not a customs union, a free trade deal. And it would only involve industry, but not agriculture. Because it was a free trade deal, they could keep their imperial preferences, they could continue to have their privileged relationship with the empire. Because it was only for industry, the Brits would be able to keep their own individual agricultural uh, policies. So it was brilliant. What's not to like? Well, what's not to like if you're British? But of course, what they were forgetting was that their partner countries had their own interests and there was plenty not to like from a European point of view. In particular, why on earth would France give Britain access to uh, French markets for British manufactured goods if in return the Brits were not going to give uh, the French access for their food exports. It made no sense. And so this was a real case of the British being so focused on what was required to maintain political consensus within their own country that they forgot that the people on the other side of the table had their interests also. And there was a certain amount, I think it's fair to say, of wishful thinking. Uh, they felt that, of course, the Europeans would be delighted. And so, of course, they're going to give us uh, what we want. And a subsequent historian uh, uh, writing before the referendum ha has described this rather nicely as, as, as the British wanting to have their cake uh, and eating it. And that's exactly what was going on. They would be able to have uh, free trade in the goods that they were interested in with Europe while at the same time maintaining 
their continent, their, their imperial links. So they try, it doesn't work, and then we know what happens. Um, part of the background is that Europe uh, is pulling ahead of Britain economically, or to put it another way around, uh, Britain is falling behind Europe. So this is Europe's income relative to the Germans and the French. They start out much richer, they end up rather poorer. And everybody's aware of this in Britain at the time. And increasingly, there's a feeling that British industry needs to compete with German industry for it to become uh, competitive. And Britain's geopolitical situation is getting weaker as well. And so they finally join in 1973, uh, as does my own country, as does my mother's country, Denmark. So this is the first enlargement of the EEC. And uh, Britain becomes a member. And it actually ends up influencing the shape of the Europe that we have today in, in a very profound way. If you were to say to Europe, I mean, to, if you were to ask me what do I think defines the European Union now, I mean, some people might say the Euro, but, but not every European member state is a member of the Euro. On the other hand, every European member state is a member of the European single market, which is largely a British creation. Uh, it was created in large part by this man here, Lord Cofield, who had been Margaret Thatcher's right-hand man. He goes off and becomes uh, Delors' right-hand man. And it's easy to see why Mrs. Thatcher was in favor of this. Mrs. Thatcher liked markets. The more market, the better. And this would be a continental market that would allow British firms to sell across Europe. 1973 had seen Britain joining the customs union. And so those rules of origin checks no longer occurred at the frontier. But there were still other sorts of checks that occurred in the frontier because things that could be legally sold in one country could not be legally sold in another country. Um, and when you have different rules about what can be legally sold and bought in different countries, then you obviously need checks at the frontiers to make sure that stuff is coming in, is not coming in, that would be illegal in your own country. This is some simple common sense. What's the solution? It isn't rocket science. The solution is you all have the same rules regarding what could be legally uh, bought and sold. And so the commission pursued this partly because it made a lot of sense economically, but also because if there were no longer these frontier inspections checking whether regulations were being adhered to uh, with respect to goods crossing frontiers, uh, then there would no longer be need for any frontier formalities whatsoever. And you could have a Europe without any borders whatsoever. And this politically, obviously, was a great interest in Brussels. Now, if anybody wants to know what these common regulations are, there's a very handy cheat sheet because in the protocol, on the Northern Irish backstop uh, in the withdrawal agreement, they have 67 pages that list all of the regulations that you need to comply with in order for there not to be uh, goods related checks at borders. So for example, it will refer you to this thing here and then you have to just follow, follow that up. And what you see is that this directive here uh, regards the safety of children's toys. It uh, concerns how much arsenic you can have in children's toys. I mean, the Europeans are risk averse. We don't actually allow arsenic in children's toys and so on. Okay, so we've all signed up to common rules, but of course those common rules have to be decided on jointly. And that's the, the kicker for the Tory party. They had advocated the creation of the single market, but in so doing, of course, they were necessitating that Europe become even more supranational, because Europe was going to have to figure out a way of deciding exactly what these common rules were going to be. So Britain has a history, Europe has a history, and so has Ireland. And it also has an economic history. So let me get on to Ireland. Um, this is a very simple chart. Uh, you, you see many of these things going around. Here we have income in 1926, rich countries, poor countries in 1926. Here we have the average growth rate of each of these countries between 1926 and 2001. And what do we observe? We see that the countries that were rich grew more slowly than the countries that were poor. That's what we see, yes? In other words, the poor countries are catching up on the rich countries. And this is something that we see very systematically, certainly within the West. It's not a global phenomenon yet, but it, it is certainly a Western phenomenon. Now, this is the picture for Europe and the USA between 1954 and 1973. And do we see a bunch of economies that are underperforming? And we do, right? We see the United Kingdom and we see Ireland. So Ireland here is 
you know, it's poorer than Italy, so it should be growing really, really quickly, but in fact it's growing, you know, as, as, as quickly as Switzerland or something. So Ireland is a terrible underperformer, and the Brits aren't doing that well either. That's before 1973, before EU membership. After EU membership, this is the difficult 1980s and 1970s, we are no longer falling behind. You know, we're now doing as well as we should. And this is the 1990s. And this is Ireland's economic miracle. So something happened, right? And everybody in Ireland understands perfectly well that our prosperity relies exclusively on the fact that we can sell into a Europe-wide single market. Um, and by the way, European membership turns out also to have been good for British uh, competitiveness and for British growth rates in this same comparative context. So there was never any chance that Ireland was going to follow Britain out of the door. That's the first point. The second point is, of course, that we have a political history. So, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this. Uh, I suppose the story starts in the 12th century. Uh, it was always inevitable that the big country was going to invade and take over the small country. I mean, in a violent world, that was probably always going to happen. But what makes this particularly difficult is the division within Western Christianity that occurs after the Reformation, because the British become Protestant and the Irish become Catholic. And that makes the Irish very difficult to digest within the context of a British body politic uh, that, in common with everybody else, doesn't have religious tolerance as its highest uh, value. And so there's nothing strange or unusual about the fact that in the 17th century, the British monarch uh, takes a bunch of settlers from England and Scotland and plants them in Northern Ireland. They're Protestants, and therefore they can be relied upon to be loyal subjects of the crown. I'm sure that you know, uh, the, the Irish would have done this if the boot had been on the other foot, but it wasn't. So what we end up with is a, a population in present-day Northern Ireland that's divided between Protestant and Catholic, but where the Protestants are British and the Catholics are Irish, by and large. And so we have national divisions coinciding with religious divisions. And of course, religious divisions mean that there's very little scope for mixing. They have different schools, but even apart from that, they go to different churches, they do different things on Sundays, they play different sports. The Protestants up there are very Sabbatarian, they don't play sports on Sundays, so of course the Catholics play all their sports on Sundays, and so on and so on and so on. There's little intermarriage, all of these things. And so you have these deeply entrenched community divisions. Now, what happens after World War I, like in this part of the world, is that there's a lot of geopolitical turmoil, and frontiers are, are redrawn. Uh, you have empires breaking down everywhere, new nation states emerging. Ireland is not an exception. The Irish Free State uh, gains de facto independence in 1922. But at the insistence of the Protestant uh, minority in Ireland, which is a majority in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland remains part of the UK. And it has remained a part of the UK ever since. And I think it's fair to say, without uh, being sectarian, that the Catholic minority in Northern Ireland was not particularly well treated for much of this period. They faced discrimination in housing, in employment, and so on. And of course, this didn't help community relations either. There wasn't even one person, one vote in Northern Irish local elections. And so in the 1960s, uh, there was a civil rights march movement uh, based on the U US civil rights movement, also looking for one person, uh, one vote. And this degenerates into violence eventually, and we end up with 30 years of violence that stretch until 1998 that cost the lives of 3,300 people. And to put that in context, it, at a French level, I did the sums for France because it was a book written for the French, that would be equivalent to 170,000 French uh, uh, fatalities. It's a very big deal in a small uh, country. Um, and yeah, well, this, this quote here I just put up, it's from a guy who lives near the border, you know, and of course the border now is a security threat on top of everything else. I mean, there had been customs checks, well now there's security check, and so the, the British army just puts a big hole in, in, in the road, and so he, he, he can go that way when he comes out of his front gate because he can't go that way because there's nothing there. So this is completely disruptive to people's lives. How does this get resolved? Well, Europe has a lot to do with it. Uh, indirectly. So firstly, in 1973, the Brits and the Irish both join, and they start meeting and they start talking to each other. Before 73, no British Prime Minister had ever visited Dublin. 
which is extraordinary, but no British Prime Minister had ever visited Dublin. Within a year or two, uh, a trip has happened after both countries joined the EEC. And of course, the officials and politicians are meeting uh, regularly at Brussels and they're getting to know each other and they're getting to realise that actually they have a lot in common. So that's the first point. The second point is that they're in the common market and after the single market programme, which comes into effect in 1993, there's no more economic borders within Europe. And this means that if you can just get rid of the violence, there's no more need for any border whatsoever. And so that is the basis for the Good Friday Agreement, which is an American brokered agreement. Bill Clinton's very involved. George Mitchell was very involved. Um, and it's a masterpiece of what they call constructive ambiguity. In other words, you're an Irish Catholic on the wrong side of the border in Northern Ireland, and you don't like that. But now you live in a world where the border is invisible. It's basically invisible. And under the Good Friday Agreement, you know, you can have an Irish passport. You don't have to have a British one. You don't have to be regarded as British. Your Irishness is as valid as Britishness. So, you know, you can be what you are in a country, in your own country, with no visible border. Why would anybody get too upset about the fact that we're in different jurisdictions? You know, both identities are regarded as equally valid in the context of Northern Ireland. That was, that was the deal. And so we have lots of moving symbols of reconciliation. I chose this one. I could have chosen many others simply because, I mean, it, it, Martin, the man on the left is Martin McGuinness, who is a former member of the IRA, so a former terrorist. Uh, he was deputy leader of Sinn Féin. He was deputy prime minister of Northern Ireland. Um, but... Uh, he's not just meeting the Queen, he's meeting a victim of, of violence because the British royal family lost Lord Mountbatten. If there are any Indians here or Pakistanis, they'll know Mountbatten from another context. But he was a very dear member of the royals and he was murdered by the IRA in the late 70s. So there were lots of moments like this. And, uh, well, I mean, if this was a fairy tale, I would say they all lived happily ever after. It's not quite that way. Uh, Northern Ireland isn't perfect. It's still very divided. Um, but things got a lot better. And then this happened in 2016. So uh, these are some of the slogans of the Leave campaign. Now, there were very good principled reasons to vote Leave. And I suppose the main slogan of the Leave campaign was take back control. Perfectly reasonable slogan. I don't see any problem with that. You can debate to what extent you're actually going to take back control. Nothing wrong with that. But they did some things that were, I think, less correct. Um, the slogan about... Uh, uh, all of the money that they were saving, sending to Brussels every week, the, the, num the number was wrong, actually. And where they really shaded into dark territory was where they started saying, you know, be careful because Turkey is going to join. Well, it was a candidate member, so I'm not going to say it was an outright lie. This is a lie. That wasn't a lie. It was disingenuous. But, you know, you see the way they helpfully remind everybody of just how many Turks there are there, you know? And here, this is, the, this is the shadier campaign. This is the, this is the official campaign. This is Farage's campaign. This is the bad guys. And they're also talking about Turkey, and they have a picture not of Turks, but of Syrian refugees. So they clearly were appealing to Islamophobia uh, in the course of the campaign, even though they didn't say so. Well, we know how the referendum went. It was very tight, um, and we could analyze the causes of the, uh, of the result. British Euroscepticism had a long and distinguished tradition. You could also see it as being in part a reaction to globalization. But I, I rather like this blog piece by Dominic Cummings, who's in the news again. He's Boris Johnson's special advisor. And it's this lovely phrase that I would give to every social science student who's uh, att attempted to regard particular historical outcomes as inevitable. So it's a real historian's phrase, you know? Uh, reality has branching histories, not a big why. It could have gone differently. And Cummings thinks that it would have gone differently quite plausibly had Johnson come out in favor of remain rather than leave, which he might well have done, uh, and if these slogans hadn't worked as well as they did. Well, Ireland immediately saw the problem because, because now we have a real problem. Uh, because, if you put, because if Britain leaves the common market, if it leaves the single market, then you have border controls. And the basis for the, the deal that was the Good Friday deal is gone. Ireland had given up its territorial claim on Northern Ireland as part of a deal that ensured that Northern nationalists would feel at home in their own country. Well, you bring back a border, immediately you bring back a grievance. And even worse, you bring back targets. 
Because if you have border controls, even if it's something like a, an automatic camera or something, well, that's a target that people can blow up. And if you try to guard these physical installations with people, then the people can get blown up. And some of the most vociferous voices against any form of physical infrastructure on the border have actually you know, have been members of the police service of Northern Ireland. You know, these people are not Irish Republicans. These people have been uh, fighting against Irish Republican terrorism you know, their whole lives. And they're saying, for God's sake, don't do this to us because we're the ones who end up being on the front line. So it was always very clearly going to be the case that Ireland was going to say, on no, under no circumstances will we accept a hard border coming back to Ireland. At least that's what the Irish were going to try to achieve. Now, I have to speed up a little bit. We started at 41, which means I have another five, six minutes, something like that. Um, history has shaped EU attitudes during these negotiations. So earlier on, I said to you that at the heart of the Treaty of Rome is this series of concerns about level playing fields, about unfair competition. And those concerns remain valid today. And so there is simply no way that the Europeans, for example, would, ex would accept uh, that uh, a UK that deregulated in an American manner would get free access to European markets. So they're very concerned about level playing fields. Secondly, the single market is a pretty difficult thing to achieve agreeing on common rules and regulations and all this stuff among 12 member states. I mean, that's a difficult negotiation. And there was no way that they were going to allow the British to take the bits of this that they liked and get rid of the bits that they didn't like because that risked having the whole thing uh, unravel. And most importantly, the Europeans have taken the view that, you know, it's okay for the Brits to take back control of their own affairs, but the Europeans have got to be allowed to retain control of their own rules and regulations. So for example, there could be no case uh, the, uh, of the City of London, for example, jointly deciding what financial regulations the European Union would have. And in particular, the Europeans are worried about borders. So here's a few quotes from Sabine Veyand, who's the new head of the, 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 the trade GG. She was Barnier's chief uh, civil servant during the Brexit negotiations. So she's saying, look, you know, we have rules about shrimps that have been treated with some sort of an antibiotic, and we don't like these things in Europe because they could make you go blind. You know, well, we don't want these things coming into Britain and then going across the Northern Irish border and coming into the European Union. We won't accept that. You know, we have tariffs on Chinese bicycles. The British could quite legitimately decide that they didn't want to have these tariffs. Well, we're not going to allow you to import Chinese bicycles duty-free into Britain and then ship them across the border and uh, evade our tariff barriers that way. And there's also questions about VAT, which is a complicated issue that I won't get into. And so the Europeans are very worried about uh, the British uh, using the Irish border as, an, as a way of getting access to the European market through underhanded means. And their suspicions are based on the fact that on the one hand, the British want to take back control and they want to leave the customs union and they want to leave the single market, which means borders. But on the other hand, we all know that there are major British interests in keeping frictionless trade, in keeping trade without borders. Uh, so think of, for example, the mini plant near Oxford where I used to work. So every day, the mini plant uses a half a million pieces that are brought in to mini in Cowley from all over Europe. And this is done on a just-in-time basis. They don't have big warehouses. It's done on a just-in-time basis because the shell of the mini appears on the platform, and then you get a command, uh, an order from some buyer in Bulgaria or something, and it's a yellow mini with automatic and air conditioning and precisely the specification. And then you take precisely the bits that you need and you put it on the mini. So everything is done just in time. Uh, and this doesn't work if there are border controls. So the British have always wanted uh, to leave this customs union, leave the single market, but not have border controls. So the Europeans know this. And the Europeans also know that the British viewed Northern Ireland as the Achilles heel of the European Union, as some unionists uh, said to Faisal Islam back in 2017. In other words, the, now this is the European suspicion, but I think it's well founded, that they think that the Brits were going to say, look, we must be prepared to tolerate a bit of smuggling in Ireland for the sake of peace, you understand. And then once we have said, OK, we'll tolerate a bit of smuggling for the sake of peace, then the British would say, well, now, look, you see, it's all working perfectly well. We've already accepted this as a precedent. We can now 
have precisely the same mechanisms for control or non-control on the route between Dover and Calais. And this, this suspicion was further heightened by the fact that in August 2017, uh, Her Majesty's Revenue Commissioners were fined a very large sum of money by the EU's anti-fraud uh, office because in fact HMRC hadn't been acting sufficiently diligently with regard to an enormous scam involving smuggled Chinese textiles that cost European taxpayers billions of dollars or euros. So the Europeans are very sensitive about this uh, and, and, and they think they've got the Brits figured out. Now it, this could all be of course in their heads, I don't personally uh, think so. There are other legal and institutional constraints that you have to take account of. So firstly, it's the, the EU has a common trade policy because it's a customs union. And that common trade policy is negotiated not by the member states. You can't have 27 countries going into a room and negotiating with Canada. It's negotiated by the commission. They have their ex executive body that's going to negotiate uh, on behalf of them. Um, they negotiate based on a mandate that will be given to them by the 27 member states. So that's how it works. And similarly, uh, the UK has not been negotiating with the, the capitals, it's been negotiating with Barnier on the basis of guidelines unanimously agreed, which means also by Ireland, of course. And that has affected what the Europeans wanted. And the Europeans, have, the British have had a hard time believing that. They really have thought that if you could go to Berlin and Paris, you could get a deal, and that's not how it works. Secondly, and very importantly, there is no legal basis for negotiating a trade deal with a member state. How can you negotiate a trade deal with a member state? You can only negotiate trade deals with non-member states, which means you can only negotiate a trade deal with the UK after it has left. And that's a big problem because these trade deals take years and years and years to negotiate. So the risk is that the British leave and then we have to wait for seven or eight years. And during that time, we have tariffs with the British, and this will be very costly. So what's the solution? The solution is that you have a transition period where Britain will be formally out, but where everything will stay the same. And during that transition period, we can negotiate the future relationship. They get that transition period if they have a withdrawal agreement. If they don't get that transition period because there isn't a withdrawal agreement, then we go straight to WTO tariffs. You know, the Europeans will, will have to treat the, the British the way they treat the Americans and everybody else. And the British will have to treat the Europeans the way they treat the Americans and everybody else. There won't be any choice in this matter. And that would be the situation for many, many years. Okay, with all that in mind, the timeline, I suppose people are familiar with most of this. Uh, the British announced that they would leave the Single Market and Customs Union. Negotiations started. Uh, the British agreed, because they had no choice in the matter, that we, they would first negotiate the divorce settlement, uh, money, citizens' rights, the question of the Irish border, and after that we could talk about the future relationship. A major breakthrough was in December, seven, se December 2017 when a joint report was issued, and there are two key paragraphs here relating to the Irish border. So the first paragraph essentially says, We'll try all sorts of ways to avoid a hard border. Uh, but if none of these ways work, then you will give us as a backstop a promise that Northern Ireland will remain in the customs union and single market. That's de facto what it means. That's certainly the European view of it. And that makes sense because if Northern Ireland de facto stays in the customs union and single market, then there's no need for a border between the North and the South of Ireland. Well, the unionists didn't like that. And so the unionists got a second promise, which is that uh, the UK promised the unionists in Northern Ireland that there wouldn't be any barriers between Northern Ireland and Britain either. Now you put those two things together and what must it mean? You put those things together and it must mean that Britain as a whole stays in the customs union and single market. That's what it would seem to imply, just logically. You know? But the problem is that that's absolutely what the British wanted to do. And so there was this kind of a trilemma. You know? Either you could you know, you could, you, there are two, two of these three things you can have, but you can't have all three of them. You can't have Britain as a whole leaving the customs union and single market and no borders between Britain and Northern Ireland and no borders between North and South. It doesn't work. What we ended up with was a deal in which there was this backstop and the backstop involved Northern Ireland staying within the single market for goods de facto. But Mrs. May said to the Europeans, 
we really, really, really do not, want, do not want to have a tariff barrier between Northern Ireland and Britain, because that's a much more sensitive issue having to do with sovereignty. And so the Europeans said, OK, as part of the backstop, we won't have Northern Ireland only staying in the customs union. We'll have all of Britain staying within the customs union. Now, the Europeans were not happy about that. And the French, in particular, were not happy about that, because this meant that Britain got the customs union almost for free. It got the customs union with very little time for negotiating about level playing fields and so on. And so the French, in particular, were very nervous about that. And they viewed the British as having gotten a very good deal. Well, what happened next was, it turned out that this big concession that Mrs. May wanted, because she thought that it would make it easier for her to get the thing passed by Parliament, actually made her life much more difficult. Because the unionists weren't happy anyway, because there would still be regulatory checks between Britain and Northern Ireland. And English nationalist liberals, let's call them, in Parliament, who didn't really care about Northern Ireland, were very unhappy that Britain, that Britain would have to stay in the customs union, which, mean, which would mean that they would not be able to show how sovereign Britain was by going off and doing trade deals with Donald Trump and, and President Xi and so on. So she ended up making nobody happy, which must have been frustrating for the Europeans, because usually you expect that when your interlocutor puts the knife under your throat and says, I need this or else I can't get this over the line, that they'll ask you for things that make their life easier not more difficult, but that's where we are. And so the withdrawal agreement was rejected, as we know, and there have been extensions. And what's happened since then is that Boris Johnson has basically been walking away from all of the previous agreements uh, made with Europe. So he's been walking away from the commitment to avoid a hard border in Ireland. Uh, and they're also walking away from the withdrawal agreements, laying pl playing field conditions. And so when you look at that, you have to assume that he is angling for a no deal, or at least that's how it seems to many people. You know, I mean, there are negotiations supposedly going on, but the question is, are they genuine or is it an exercise in blame allocation? And as we know, Parliament uh, doesn't want no deal. And, and, and we, have this huge, we have this huge fight in our hand. I think... I mean, it's all very exciting, prorogation and what's going to happen next and will there be a coalition of national unity and so on. I think the unfortunate point is that at the end of the day, the British only have three choices. They can either remain, which Parliament has rejected on several occasions. They can leave with no deal, which Parliament has rejected on several occasions. Or they can leave with the deal, which isn't going to change unless perhaps we go back to a backstop that is only for Northern Ireland. And th those are their three choices. They won't be able to leave with a future trade relationship already negotiated, which some people want, including some people in Labour, because you, you are not allowed to negotiate this before Brexit. So they cannot have, they have to choose something, but they don't like any of the choices. And that is the dilemma that we're facing. And so I'll just leave you with this picture. Um, that's really where we are today. And Her Majesty has become sufficiently worried uh, that she's telling people, this is from January, that they really all should calm down and uh, learn to respect each other. And there's no signs of that happening right now, but I'm sure that it's a good advice. And, and perhaps on, 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 on that note, uh, with, with, with Elizabeth's words, which are absolutely appropriate, I might uh, leave it there and uh, ask for your questions. And thank you for your attention.